them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Titus 2.15 these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. James 5.20 Let him know that he which convert the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Amen. All right. Uh, Brother Aaron, would you, uh, would you ask God's blessing on the service, please? Father, we thank you for such a wonderful day that you've given us. We thank you, Father, that you have allowed us once again to come back <coughs> into the house of God to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask, Father, that you are moved by your spirit. Amen. And now, use our pastor as your mouthpiece tonight, that mm -hmm. you may be honored and glorified, and that the body of Christ here will be edified. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and utilize the things in which we learn. <coughs> For it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. 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 All right, just turn over one page to 348. 348, I'm sure you want to warn you about that. 348, my hope is in the Lord. 348, 348.
Father, we do ask tonight as you, we come to a time to give back to you that you would help us to be joyful givers. Mm -hmm. Help our pastor tonight, strengthen him through preaching the word. Help the garrisons as they'll be uh, helping with the kids tonight. Have your hand upon them also. Yes. We'll be careful to honor and praise you for all things. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. so much that you can get out of Genesis. It's taken us a good long time, but it's been good. It's been a good good study through Genesis. Uh, but Genesis 44, and um, uh, we're going to proceed with what happens next in the strange series of events in the lives of these 11 brothers. So, um, so let's go ahead and, and look there. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his mouth, in his sack's mouth. And put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth, the youngest, and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city, and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up! Oh, Follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and, where, and whereby indeed he divineth? He have done evil in so doing, and he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore said my Lord these words? God forbid that, they, that thy servants should, be, should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sack's mouth we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be thy Lord's, thy Lord's bondmen. By, I'm sorry, be my Lord's bondmen. And he said, Now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they rent their clothes and laid at every man his ass and returned to the city. Wow. Within one journey back, we see the cycle of emotions that average human beings go through pretty much. I mean, when it comes to emotions, we go up and down a lot of times. And we see that they were overjoyed. Then we see that they were overtaken, sometimes with problems, sometimes with people, sometimes with pain. Then they're overconfident. I can handle this. You know, uh, I know I tend to be that way. I can handle this. I got this. Don't we feel like that? We really do. But uh, then overwhelmed, you know, that's a, I mean, we're talking like within a, within a moment, you know, it's almost like a, it's almost like the grief cycle just happening in one page here. And, uh. So that's, that's pretty much what I see in the passage we just read. Uh, but it's amazing how God works in people's lives, isn't it? It really is. Um, most of the time we have, uh, we have absolutely no, no idea just how, how much interest he takes in our lives as individuals. Yes. But he really does. I mean, it's, you know, the whole idea that he's got uh, every hair of our head numbered ought to give you an indication of how interested he is in every event that, that, that is in our lives. Um, Sure, he loves the church as a body, just as he loved the nation of Israel as a nation, but within the body of Christ are intricate little details. Yours, 
He cares about each of us individually. He cares about every little problem, trial, different things that we face. It's, uh, it, it's all his business, and it's very important to him. Um, but he cares about your issues. He cares about all the little things that you have to deal with. Draven, all right, man, it's good to see you. All right, so now that Shania's not here, now we got Draven. <laughs> all right, it's good to see you, man. But, uh, uh, but have you ever asked the question, what in the world is God doing? You know, I, I've asked that question. And uh, guess what? Back in verse 42, these brothers asked the very same question in verse 28. He says, what is this that God has done unto us? They're saying the very same thing. What is God doing? So, uh, so we, we, we see, let's look at some of these emotions, all right? They're happy, first of all. Everything's great. They've got Simeon, Benjamin's good. And the journey is halfway over. Let's get out of here, okay? And, uh, but then they get overtaken. Oh, man. As they're on the way back, Joseph Stewart and his guard are tracking them down. Oh, well, we must have forgotten something. Here comes Joseph Stewart. You know, they, they, they just had a feast with this guy. And, uh, by the way, is this pulpit? Is this pulpit crooked? I guess it is a little bit, isn't it? <laughs> I can't feel like I'm looking at you guys. After. Oh, there we go. Okay. It's just, I'm sorry, I had to fix it. I had to fix it. But anyway... <laughs> I just had to. But anyway, all right. But, uh, yeah, we must have forgotten something. No, look at verse 4, okay? In verse 4 it says, And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his stewards, Up, oh, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have you rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh? And whereby indeed he divineth, ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. Who, us? Sir, we are not thieves. I mean, they were very confident. They were overconfident with themselves. I, I can't believe that you even think such a thing. Overconfident. Sometimes we can be that way with God. We can have that attitude with God. We can say... Lord, I, as far as I know, there's nothing wrong with me. And we don't take much time to let him search us. Oh, we're overconfident. The fault is with you. Who, me? No, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all. I, I pray all the time. I read the Bible all the time. I confess sins all the time. I witness all the time. Not me, you. The finger's pointing at you. He's pointing at me. These guys are overconfident. Look at verse 7. And they said unto him, Wherefore, wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks' mouths we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will, put my, will be my Lord's bondsmen. That's a really, that's a real big statement right there. They're very overconfident. Mm -hmm. So, I can't help but wonder what the steward must have been thinking. I'll tell you, if you look carefully, you're going to find humor in the Bible like crazy. It's really, it's funny. You know, I, I can imagine the stewards thinking, these poor guys, they really are speaking the truth. You know, I'm sure he's thinking, they, they really didn't steal the cup. I mean, my master set him up. You know, they're... I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like to be the steward? <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but isn't this how we feel about some people that we know? You know, we look, uh, this guy's looking at him, he's like, these poor guys, I don't know what in the world my master is doing, but they're innocent. Godly people. People that, that, you know, who know better. Did the servant know that they were innocent? Sure. Verse 1 and 2 makes that very clear. All right, they were, they were set up. Joseph says, put the cup in there, all right? But were the brothers innocent? Mm. Not by a long shot. Mm. See, they were guilty. Stuart didn't know that. See, the steward didn't know his fate. He, he, he was basically following Joseph's directions. But they were not innocent by a long shot. And I'm going to tell you that when you start deifying people, you got to be careful about deifying people. About well, so and so said this, so I'm not going to agree with this. So and so said this, so I'm going to agree. I'm not going to agree with this. You're either going to be disappointed, or they're going to lead you down an evil path because you trusted them. 
And I mean, I, look, everything that I say, you need to look up. I take no offense when I'm preaching something, and if it sounds a little bit off, I like it when you're looking it up in the Bible and making sure that what I'm saying is true. And if there's anything that I say that's not true, you need to come to me about it after church and tell me, because I don't want to be preaching anything false. So it's important that we look to the Word. I've, I've known all sorts of people that lost the sweetness of Christ because they listened to someone that they trusted and led them astray. Uh, Miss Helen, she, under, she, she experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit. She shared with me her, her testimony, and she said, um, she said the, the fullness was so great that I just couldn't help but smile in the middle of church. Do you remember this? And she said, uh, she said the rest of the church just couldn't, they couldn't get a hold of that spirit that I had, and it started to feel dead to me, and so I had to find some other place, and she joined the Pentecostal church. And I'll tell you, they've got some great zeal. Those people have got great zeal. They are, they are the most excited Christians you've ever seen, but their doctrine's off. And she said that she went there, and she thought that she'd found her family, and they just uh, the, the, the whole doctrine that went on in the Pentecostal church, it just tore her down. It just, it, it, she, she, she said she just lost her joy. It turned into something fake. But trust the Bible, not just what somebody says. Don't trust what somebody says and then just assume that it's right. Make sure that the scriptures say it. I don't care who it is. I don't care, I don't care how highly you esteem that person. Many people can be led astray. Listen to Proverbs 28.10. Whoso causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit, but the upright shall have good things in possession. But... But going back to this, the steward is just doing his job. Um, you know, I, I personally think he deserves an Emmy Award for this. I mean, he was doing some great acting here. Oh, um, okay, he says. Sounds good to me. But I'm going to change the terms a little. Because you guys are in charge. I am. <laughs> I can just see him. I'm going to let the rest of you go, and the one that has the cup is going to stay here. Oh, boy. So... They were almost out of here, and so they start opening the sacks, and notice again that they, they, they know who the oldest to the youngest is in, this, in, the, in our passage. Oh, it, it, it's, it's in that order. It just goes to show the, the care of individuals in the eyes of God. Uh, Joseph is a picture of Jesus. Remember that. I, I, I haven't really emphasized that a whole lot recently, but a lot of times Jesus, we, we've kind of taken a little turn uh, in, in the story of Joseph. Uh, but, but we see how that God takes care in individuals from the oldest to the youngest. Um, you know, I, I have no doubt they were thinking, okay, they've done it again. I can understand the chances of them getting us in perfect order the first time might have been, you know, slim to none. But good night, they've done it again? What in the world? You know, these, these guys have never met us before and they keep putting us in the same order. What's up with this? Now, I, I got to just, I got to pause and chuckle at some of the humor that we find in this story. If you look back at verse 1, Joseph restored their money again. They didn't just put the cup in there. He put their money back in there. Now, it doesn't say anything about the money showing up as they're taking the bags down. But they're cutting the sacks open, and these guys are overconfident. We haven't stolen anything. And as they open Reuben's sack, there's the money. I, I don't know if you can imagine Reuben's face, but he's, he's sitting here going, yeah, we haven't stolen anything. Huh? <laughs> what the, <laughs> you know, there's money in the sack. You know, he's, he's looking for the master's cup and he's finding the master's money. <laughs> you know, I can imagine they must have been scared to death. Sir, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I just uh, I swallowed one of those camels. I mean, gnats. You know? <laughs> By the way, isn't it interesting that, that the, 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 the boys said almost the exact same thing as their dad back in Genesis 31, 32? You don't have to look there, but I'm just giving you the passage. But his dad basically says to his father-in-law, uh, Laban, Laban. I don't know what I was thinking of another name, but anyway, Laban. He says to his, his father-in-law, Whoever has your, okay, see, so Rachel stole her father's gods, all right? Basically, if you, steal, if, uh, if you inherit your father's gods, according to the tradition in the land, um, you basically got his inheritance. 
you got everything that he had. That's really what the gods were about. She basically took the will and rewrote it, pretty much. And, uh, and, and so Laban comes and he goes, why did you take my gods? You took everything else? You had to take my gods too? And he says, whoever has your gods, let them die. And so I can just hear Rachel, Jacob, would you shut up? <laughs> you, know, you know, he's got, you know, here he is making these, these, these bold things. You know, he's overconfident. You know, it really goes to show that, that, uh, that our, our example reflects and, 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 our, and influences other people. We have to really be careful. But um, there's a lot of, there's some great stuff in there. But they get to Benjamin and bam, Benjamin's got the cup. So they hop from overjoyed to overtaken to overconfident to overwhelmed. I, you know, I, I don't know, my mom, whenever something bad would happen, my, my wife will tell you, my boys know, know this, but whenever something bad would happen or, you know, she, you know, she would hear about something terrible taking place, she'd go, oh, <laughs> just like that. Do you remember that? <laughs> okay. You know, towards the end of her life, she did it really bad. I can just see, I can just see as soon as the cup shows up, I can hear my mom, oh, I can't believe this. So they... They walk back to Egypt, and what a walk, getting back to Egypt. Oh, you know, what, what was the cup doing in Benjamin's sack? Benjamin, what were you thinking? I'm sure that they were probably thinking something. How in the world did it get there? So back to the, what I was saying about the strange reasons for doing everything that Joseph was doing. The key, I believe, is found in verse 13 of our text. All right, look what it says. Then they rent their clothes and laid at every man his ass and returned to the city. That, that right there, they rent their clothes. That to me is the key of why Joseph was doing everything that he was doing. Yes. Traditionally, when someone rents their garments, it's because someone died. So when they see that their brother has the cup, they rent their clothes because they're they're horrified. I mean, they're grieving. Now, the brothers wouldn't have done that in the past. They would have said, Benjamin, it looks like you're done for, pal. I mean, imagine, Benjamin was another one of Rachel's sons. So they were having a change of heart, the fact that they rent their clothes. Their grief is strongly demonstrated here. I, I don't know if you can imagine what's going through their mind, but I can imagine that they said, you know, is he going to become a slave? Is he going to be killed? How can we be so foolish to make such a proposal? You know, they, they, they made this horrible promise. This isn't fair. I'm sure they were thinking these things. But what's fascinating to me is that Judah is taking some amazing steps in this whole thing. If you don't pay attention, you're going to miss Judah. You know, um, there, there's a lot that's said about Judah in the Bible. Um, uh, there, there's a passage in Psalm that says that God chose Judah over Joseph. And I'm going to explain that in just a minute, but he takes some amazing steps. He took responsibility with his father. He offered his own life for Benjamin's if Benjamin did not return. Now Judah is preparing a plea in his mind. What am I going to tell? What am I going to tell Joseph? Or, you know, they, uh, Zaphnath put it up. Whatever. They, they didn't know it was Joseph yet. But they're on their way back, and Judah's the one that we can learn from the most here. Judah was wicked. We kind of covered the chapter. Uh, we, we were looking at Joseph, so we kind of skipped it a little bit, but I gave a, a brief description. But basically, Jacob had two wicked, he had some wicked sons. Basically, they probably learned from their father. They were influenced by their dad, and they did some wicked things, and it says that God took their life away. And uh, uh, Tamar is left alone, and so she dresses up like a harlot. Judah comes into town, sees her dressed up like a harlot, and he, he says, hey, let's, uh, let's go over to, to the nearest hotel here, you know. And, and she, he has no idea that it's his daughter-in-law. And she says, well, what are you going to give me? I'll give you my signet ring and my staff, and, you know, we'll call it even. And so she says, okay. And so they do their business, and she gets pregnant. And all of a sudden, later on, somebody comes up and says, your daughter-in-law's played the harlot. She's pregnant with somebody's child. And he goes, well, let her come out here and be burned. And she goes, whoever has these rings, whoever's ring and staff this is, that's the father. Do you remember that story? And, uh, and he's like, she's more righteous than I am. 
I mean, that must have been shameful for him. What a shame. But he, was, he lived a very wicked life. But I'll tell you, God's in the business of changing lives, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> he really is. And we see that here. Judah's about to go higher in his life. Um, I'm going to stop there for a moment. Just say we can all learn from what Judah's about to do. While we, didn't, while we don't think that we're in the wrong many times, Judah didn't either. There's a lot of times that, that Judah thought, you know, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. Uh, unfortunately, he lived with a lot of consequences. His brothers didn't think they did the wrong thing either. They had to be confronted. They had to be dealt with. We often focus on who we are right now, don't we? Well, I'm doing fine. We kind of forget about some of the sins that, we've, that we might have uh, committed against somebody else, some things that we need to get right with people in the past. We've got to make sure that everything's clear. We need to make sure that the, that the Holy Spirit is happy with us. We need to say, Lord, I need you to search me. I need you to... Lord, is there anything that's bothering you? Is there anything... You can learn a lot from David. David says, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this wickedness in thy sight. All right, now what does he mean? All right, does that mean that he's forfeiting the fact that he's wronged Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba and Israel? No, he's not saying that. What he's saying is, is, is whatever you call sin in my life, that's what I need to recognize. Against you and you only have I sinned. So you, Lord, you show me what I've done wrong. You know, it, you start going over this list of sins and things, all of a sudden you become a Catholic. I mean, God does, God's not interested in you beating yourself to death. I used to do that. I remember I, I, I pulled up a, some Catholic catechism. Uh, I thought, well, it's Catholic, but I mean, it's going to help me. And I mean, I looked up, there was probably 500 or so sins in there. And I would go over this thing every day. And I would highlight ones that I struggled with, and I would end up double highlighting, and then I ended up underlining it with a red pen, and I thought, I can't shake these, and I would go over these things, you know, bad thoughts, and all this stuff, I mean, I would just go, I felt so Catholic, and it was just so weighty, it was such a heavy life, finally the Lord said, throw that paper away, and you deal with the things I show you, he's a living Lord, and he loves us, and he cares about us. Uh, sometimes we need to remember 1 Corinthians 11, of such were some of you. We need to, we need to make sure that we look at our lives past and, and say, you know, uh, I, I used to be this. I, 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 you know, we need to, sometimes it's good to remember what the Lord brought us from. It's not good to grieve over our past and say, you know, oh, woe is me. You know, no, it's, it, we need to rejoice over where the Lord brought us from. Uh, we need to be reminded of what our flesh is capable of. Uh, the, the, there's never going to come a time that we're going to stop growing in the Lord. We're always going to be growing in the Lord. Yes. Um, there's never going to come a time when we no longer need to depend on the Lord. So now let's look at verse 14 here, okay? Uh, this, is, uh, this is amazing. So Judah's getting ready to speak for all of his brothers. And uh, basically what happens is, is, is Judah, uh, he, he practically comes clean. He says, I can't say anything else but what I am. He actually... He actually confesses his guilt. Listen. And Judah and his brother and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. There it is twice. They, they, they all bowed before him. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Watch ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? He said, We're guilty. Guilty of that? No, they, they didn't do that. They didn't steal the cup. They didn't steal the money. Joseph planted that. Judah's coming clean with what he did before. See? He says, what can we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Is he talking about the cup? No. They're innocent of that. He's talking about what they did to Joseph. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, but both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in, the, in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O oh, my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in thy Lord's ears. And let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one. And his brother is dead, 
and he alone is left, and his, and his mother and his father loveth him. And, they, and, and thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of thy Lord, of my Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down if our youngest brother be with us. Then will we go down. For we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if he take this also from me, and mischief befall him, he shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad. What that means is, is he said, I, I, took, I, I offered my life for, for, for Benjamin's. So, so he's talking about himself. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. Do you see what Judah's doing? He's saying, my life for his. I'll take his punishment. I mean, he's doing exactly what his future, his, the line of Christ, all right, Judah, G Jesus comes out of the tribe of Judah. He's, getting, he's, he's doing exactly what Jesus was going to be doing in, 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 in a little yeah. while. Yeah. He said, For how shall I go to my father and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. What a plea. I mean, Judah is the man here. I mean, we're, we're look, you know, we, we, we look down on Judah because of some of the things that he's done. But boy, I'll tell you what. God is really doing a work in Judah's life. He's preparing him to be a lion's whelp. He's, he's preparing him uh, for, for the line of Christ. Uh, you know, you'll notice some of the most remarkable instances when God would lift up a person who humbles himself. Um, I want you to look at, um, uh, I want you to look, you know, the, the Bible says this in, uh, in James 4.10. It says, I think it's James 4.10. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. If you don't think that just simply humbling yourself isn't going to change anything, Think again, all right? Look at 1 Kings 21, if you would, just really quick. We're going to look at two passages here, and then we're going to be done. God's, I, I love what God does in Judah's life. I just, I love it. I'm going to see if I can, while you're, while you're turning there. All right, so 1 Kings 21 and verse 27. Look what it says. All right, so uh, before we actually read it, I want to just remind you that this is the story where Ahab sees Naboth's vineyard who, that's right next to the palace, all right? And what happens? All right, he, he says, hey, I'd like to buy your vineyard from you, pal. I'll give you three times the amount. I don't know exactly what he says, uh, but, uh, but Naboth says, uh, no, no, no! You know, he 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 knew he did the right thing. You're not supposed to give your you're not supposed to give your land away that belongs to your family. So no, I, I can't do this. He said, well, it's right up against my palace. I want this thing. No, no, no! I can't do it. I, I would never do. I would never betray my ancestors like this. And uh, so he's sitting here having a pity party, and Jezebel comes in and he says, "Well, you're the king, aren't you? Just have the man kill, then you can take it for free." <laughs> Jezebel was wicked. And, uh, and he, he does. He, he, she, she writes letters and uh, falsely accuses him, and he's, he ends up being killed, and Ahab's standing right there in the vineyard, and here comes Elijah, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Peacemaker. All right? Um, he says, um, he, look, look what it says in verse 27, and it came to pass when Ahab heard those words. Okay, so Elijah basically says, you're going you're gonna to die, Ahab. 
your blood is going to, where, where, where Naboth's blood was spilled, that's where your blood's going to be spilled. And so this is what it says, And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. Wow! Can you imagine how the angels must have been feeling? <laughs> Ahab? Lord, what's the matter with you? Uh, you know, this guy is wicked, you know. But you know, here's, here's the problem. When somebody humbles themselves before God, he can't help himself. What makes you think that your sin's worse than Ahab? Let's look at another passage. Um, I, I want you to look at 2 Kings 21. 2 Kings chapter 21. We're going to look at a couple of verses. We're not going to actually read through everything, but Manasseh was a wicked king. I mean, he was just probably the, the, the wicked of the wicked. Yes. Um, listen to how it's worded, the things that he did. I mean, this guy, when I think of Manasseh, I can't help but think of Marilyn Manson. I don't know how many of you know who that is, but he's, he's like some liquid metal rock singer who's got a blind eye. And he's always, his pictures are always scary looking. They're very satanic. Uh, you know, he's known for the guy that rips Bible pages out of the Bible while he's, while he's singing his, his, his garbage. But, uh, but this is, that's who I think of when I think of Manasseh. I think of this dark Satan worshiper kind of a guy. I mean, he was wicked. But look at 2 Kings 21 and verse 2. And he, that's Manasseh, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So his wickedness was so bad that he did everything that the people were killed for before Israel came and took possession. I mean, he was, he was a bad, bad guy. Look at verse 6. And he made his son pass through the fire. What does that mean? That means he sacrificed his children. What a horrible man. I mean, he sacrificed to this God and observed times and used enchantments. And dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Look at verse 9. But they hearkened not. Okay, so the prophets came. They tried to warn them. They hearkened not. And Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. You know what? If the Lord wants me to stop, I'm just going to make it even worse. We're going we're gonna to commit more iniquity. I don't know what he was thinking. But he's basically saying, we're going to commit more iniquity than the nations before Israel. We're going to do whatever we want. I don't want God in here. I don't, I don't want him anywhere near us. We can do whatever we want. We're free. I mean, he was just, he was something. I don't know what he was. Demon possessed or something. I don't know what his deal was. But he was wicked. Uh, verse 16, moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. Beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin and doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. This was a bad, bad boy. I mean, he was wicked. Uh, they, it's, uh, historically, it's historic that he actually took a wood saw and cut Isaiah in half with a wood saw. I mean, he was just a horrible man. And we think to ourselves, how could God ever forgive a man like that? But look over at 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 33. 2 Chronicles 33. This is right after the kings here. And verse 11. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe they drug him through some, you know, they tortured him. I know that. And uh, they, they, they probably drug him through the ground and just they, they bound him with fetters, uh, carried him to Babylon. Look at verse 12. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. And what does it say? Humble himself very greatly before the God of his fathers. I just can't, I just can't imagine being God and going, oh, now you're sorry. <laughs> you know, 
After you did all this wickedness, all this bloodshed, cutting my servant Isaiah in half, all these enchantments and sorceries, now you're in affliction. Now you want me to deliver you. But that's not God's attitude, is it? Look, uh, look at verse 13. And prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and he heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. That's incredible. Verse 16. Look what it says in verse 16. All right, skip down a couple. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Verse 17 says, Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. So I guess, I guess, uh, I think there's a law that says that you're not going to pick out any place to sacrifice uh, uh, except where I appoint. And so that was the thing that they were doing wrong. But they did sacrifice to the Lord. And uh, so, I mean, we're, we're looking at a man who just was absolutely vile. Don't you think God will draw that to you if you humble yourself before him? Yeah. I mean, this guy was in a mess. He was in affliction. He's in the prison cell and he goes, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done what I've done. And God had mercy on him. Why? Because God can't help himself. He loves us. It's incredible. And he did that with Judah in this story. We can really learn a lot from Judah. Judah said, hey, you know, the attitude that we ought to have before our God is, what can I say? I can't say anything. I'm guilty, Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. That was Judah's attitude. He basically, he, he, you know, he, he, didn't, he didn't say anything about that cup. If I was Judah, I'd be like, Lord, I, what can I say, Lord? I'm guilty. Not about the cup. <laughs> Not about the money, but Joseph. We did something evil a long time ago. I, would, I might would have said something like that, but Judah doesn't even recognize the cup. He says, we're guilty, period. Our sins have been found out. That's humbling yourself. You're not saying, Lord, I'm sorry, but that, that erases everything before. Yeah. Yes. We need to just come clean with God. So that's something that we can learn. And then the next, uh, next week, we're going to look at um, uh, Joseph's going to reveal himself. That's going to really be, really be a blessing. So I, I'm looking forward. I always, I always love that story when he reveals himself finally to his brothers. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for uh, this time we can be together. Lord, Lord, thank you for the story.